one of the buildings as one of the planes came in and collided and created a huge fireball. Now, that event, the 9-11 event, was also discussed in the social context that I've described um, when, we, when, for example, we were taking lunch with the project engineers. There was a conversation I remember between my father and one of the other guys from Parsons, and he said, Ray, what is this 9-1-1 event everybody's talking about? And I understand it's some kind of domestic Pearl Harbor. Is it serious? And my dad said, yep. And he goes, well, what happened? And he goes, my dad then gave the conventional explanation for 9-11. He said, Middle Eastern terrorists uh, hijacked several commercial airliners. They, they slammed them into the, the Twin Towers that they're building in New York City. And, and the guy goes, well, what happens next? And he says, the, the buildings come down like a ton of bricks. And the guy's going, really? Right in the middle of downtown New York? My God, that's awful. Because what happens next? And my dad said, the country recovers, picks itself up, dusts itself off, and goes on like nothing happened. Okay, so my father had a basic conventional understanding of 9-11. Mm. Just as if he was alive in our time when 9-11 happened and could could gather uh, just an everyday man's understanding of what 9-11 was, as you would read it like in a conventional Wikipedia entry or, or news account of it, right. without any, any, any deep political uh, insight. So that convinces me that he would have had read of it in the intelligence reports that, for example, were being promulgated from the microfilm summaries of future events that we would be going to the future and taking back. Hmm. So what, I, what I'm saying is I believe what entered the intelligence reports that were being circulated by the uh, principals of Project Pegasus, people like Donald Rumsfeld, uh, would have been just a conventional telling of the 9-11 event. Right. So, but, the, but the event was discussed in front of me. So when, when I was doing my research during and after the event, I was mindful that was, that was one of the data points. That was one of the data points that uh, I had, that had been you know, sort of serendipitously shared with me when I, when I was on the project. It certainly didn't enter any of our specialized schooling, I only had prior knowledge of it because it had been spoken of in my presence and because I simply happened to be in my father's company when he was summoned down to Socorro to view that, that image. And at that point, images. did you or your fa father feel that uh, it was, or rather, could you, were you in a position where you could uh, talk to someone about this or write it down for future reference or get the word out to help help people that was, you know, that got... Um, um, killed in the event or or what was the relationship there so to speak to the information was like yes this is real it's going to happen can we prevent it can we warn someone or did you and your dad have the approach that no we can't step in or we can't talk to to someone about this well there was certainly no urgency among the project people to do anything to act upon the information that they were being that they were privy to for example when you're in law enforcement and you're let's say investigating a murder case and you find that somebody is doing something with their life that's destructive or something, you basically have sort of this hands-off attitude. You know, if I'm investigating a first-degree murder case, I'm not going to worry if somebody has an alcohol addiction that I meet during my investigation. In other words, there was a sort of a, a sanctity issue where there was this institutional, and also, uh, institutional decision and also sort of this consensus among the people directly involved in the project, like my father, that they would not engage in quantum engineering. In fact, the subject of, when I asked at the lunch table one time why an engineering company like Ralph M. Parsons was involved in this time travel project, um, my dad tried to explain that Parsons was, um, you know, one of the world's largest process engineering companies and did a lot of defense work for the government. But then Bob Beckwith chimed in and said, Andy, that's because someday we want to involve our, we want to be involved in quantum engineering. And I said, what's that? And he said, actually changing the future for the better based on studying the potentialities that could occur. And everybody at the table actually scowled. They almost groaned with derision for that assertion by, by Mr. Beckley. He was clearly in the minority among the project people. The conventional wisdom, the consensus among all the people in the project was that they would gather information about future events and engage in contingency planning, but not alter the events. And as I think I mentioned on our first broadcast, there's a, there's a quantum paradox that also would cause the government to do this anyway, and that is, if you know of a big event by nine, uh, like 9-11, and that event sends out waves of, of causality that influence everybody on the planet, or everybody in the, uh, in the developed world, let's say, 
in their attitudes, their beliefs, their, their decisions. If you then prevent that event from occurring, you diminish the intelligence value of all events that you've gotten prior knowledge of that occur after that event that you change. Right. You, you, essentially, you essentially alter the future in a way that causes the, the future that does occur to escape the ambit of your search for what the future holds. If that makes any sense. Okay, yep, so, yep, gotcha. so, so, so because of that paradox, clearly the decision to you, to not intervene regarding future events, at a minimum, must have been they at, me, at least they must have imposed what we would call in the law a rule of reason. What I suspect they did is they had this bias to not alter future events because they did not want to play God and they wanted to engage in contingency planning, and they also didn't want to alter the value of their intelligence database after they regarding the events that would occur after they altered a specific big event that was going to occur. For example, if they had prevented 9-11 to save 3,000 human souls uh, from, 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 from perishing in that tragic event. Yeah. I think what they may have done is applied a rule of reason. Well, wait a minute. If it's really a super catastrophic event, like losing a major world city to an, an act of atomic terrorism, let's then intervene and try to catch up with our intelligence gathering regarding events after that. And that's what I think may have occurred that, that spurred the Iraq war. When we saw Colin Powell there being embarrassed uh, by going in front of the UN and insisting that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, what I, what I suspect happened is that on one alternate future that they had forward intelligence on, or, or of, I should say, he did, uh, he did obtain weapons of mass destruction and probably used them to destroy a major city perhaps London, Paris, New York, Washington, D.C. We really don't know where. Um, uh, and then we intervened to, to topple his regime. The United States intervened and its allies intervened to topple his regime. And then the net effect was that he didn't obtain weapons of mass destruction. But we still had the reputation of the Secretary of State, Colin Powell, being besmirched before the U.N. because he had asserted that and we did have evidence that Saddam uh, was seeking, at least seeking weapons of mass destruction. So I think they may, they may have decided to apply what, what we would call in the law a rule of reason to decide when to act to prevent a specific event, but in the process jeopardize the quality of their intelligence database for all data points occurring after that event. But I, if I was asked, let's say, in front of the U.S. Congress tomorrow or whatever, on Monday, what was it? I would say that they had made an institutional decision not to act. And that means that relative to, you know, to change a future event that they had foreknowledge of. And that means that relative to the 9-11 event, they in all likelihood engaged in contingency planning for it, uh, but let it happen. Now, what is the evidence that, that, they, that they had foreknowledge of it? Well, we know that President George W. Bush spoke of seeing the footage within the, during the day of the event. He spoke in terms of having footage of the first plane hitting the first tower. And unfortunately, in terms of conventional uh, videography, that those images weren't available for another day. So that could not have happened unless the U.S. presence, presidency, unless the executive office of the president was possessed of um, chronovision, right? In other words, whether they could loop into his computer, you know, his laptop in his uh, limousine, uh, non-local images of the of the first plane hitting the first tower. Yeah, yeah. The second thing we know is that the National Security Advisor, who later became Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice, advised former Mayor Willie Brown of San Francisco yeah. to not travel that morning. We also know that when Secretary Rumsfeld became Defense Secretary for the second time under President George W. Bush, he had his, his office moved to the other side of the Pentagon from where the projectile of some kind, whether it was a plane or a missile, hit the Pentagon right. on September 11th, yes. and so forth. We had, In other words, we had data points indicating that they knew the event was going to occur, at least was going to occur on some September 11th. They might not have had the year, and therefore they were engaging in, in what was indicated they would be engaging in when I was a kid on Project Pegasus, which was contingency planning for future events, but not um, actually quantum engineering where they were trying to change a future event. More evidence that they had prior knowledge is the way in which this, the uh, Osama bin Laden was attributed as the, the progenitor of the event in the American mass media immediately after the event. Uh, I, I think on NBC, Katie Kirk and Tom Brokaw 
used the word, used the name Osama bin Laden something like 200 times. 